Well, good morning, everybody. All right, welcome to the house of our God. Thank God for Sunday, huh? You made it. <laughs> you made it through the week, you made another one. <laughs> and you made it into the house. God bless you all for making it into the house. Amen. You know, it's important that we come together. You know that? Because we need each other. I think more than we realize, we need each other. You know, so I, I hope that you were blessed by somebody when you walked through the doors this morning. Amen. I hope you received a hearty hello. I hope you received some love, maybe a hug, you know. Um, I hope you received what you needed. Amen. Uh, I must say, uh, not one of you were taken for granted. Each one of you add value to this house. Each soul adds value to this house. You know, uh, Randy, we missed you for a couple of weeks. Thank God he brought you back. Yeah, good man. All of you, God bless you. I had a chance to meet Pastor, Pastor Marlon and, and your lovely wife. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming and visiting with us. Our brother was a pastor with the Nazarene Church, but he treated us by coming to us this morning. So we, uh, we're real glad to have you this morning and, uh, and everybody else. God bless you this morning. You know, uh, Pastor Phil and myself, and I know a lot of you are in agreement with us, we believe that 2024 is really an extraordinary year with all of our hearts. You can see the banner behind us. It's heaven's drop down. We're going to speak from Isaiah 45. And uh, in Isaiah 45, we read about the great King Cyrus. The great King Cyrus is the one whom God anointed to rebuild Jerusalem. And we believe that it's time to rebuild Jerusalem. It's time to build the city of our God. And I believe God's call, calling us together to do such a thing. Amen. So with that, let's see. Um, maybe we can turn in our Bibles. Let's turn to the 45th chapter of Isaiah. And I want to talk to you a few minutes about the Cyrus anointing. The Cyrus anointing. Because King Cyrus, he was a pagan king. But yet God chose him. God said that you are my, my anointed and you will be the one that rebuilds the house of God. You see, Cyrus was born in a little town in Persia around 600 B.C. And he began as king of Persia. But, but as he conquered lands and more lands and more lands, <sighs> Cyrus the Great owned the greatest empire the ancient world had ever seen. He conquered the Persians, the Medes, he conquered Lydia, he conquered the superpower of the day. The superpower of the day was Babylon. And Cyrus the Great was known as King of Kings. He was known as the king of the four corners of the earth, Cyrus the Great. And it's interesting because Isaiah 45, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about this king maybe a hundred or some odd years before he was even born. And it says that God called him and chose him and his name is even recorded before he was born. Isn't that amazing? That Cyrus would be the one. So he was born, you know, he was born to be a leader. His father and his grandfather before him were both kings. They were kings of Persia. He was he was Cyrus, he was King Cyrus II because his great-grandfather was Cyrus I, but he wasn't, he wasn't Cyrus the Great, he was just Cyrus. Cyrus number two was Cyrus the Great. There's an interesting story attached to that. It seems as if when, um, when, when, when Cyrus, the original, he was ruling uh, the Medes, he had a dream one day that his grandson would be born and would be more mightier than him and would rule the world. And Cyrus was jealous of his own grandson and wanted to have his grandson killed, such as they did back in the day, the evil monarchs. So he wanted to have his grandson killed. And there's a, you know, there's folk tale involved with that, how he tried to kill his grandson. But there was, it's interesting. It's interesting. The man that was in charge of killing him brought him to a shepherd and asked the shepherd to guard his life and protect him. Mm, interesting, it was a shepherd that raised Cyrus. And then later on in life, King, the original Cyrus realized his grandson was still alive, but by that time it was too late and he rose to greatness. King Cyrus the Great, 
when he was just a young man, his cousin ruled Persia. And as he was rising up in power, he conquered his cousin and he began to rule over Persia. He was called the king of Persia, his first province that he ruled over. Amen. He was an amazing man, chosen by God. So scripture tells us, chosen by God. A heathen king. Huh, interesting. Later on, it says that, that he went a little further north and he, he, he conquered the land of Media. And he, he conquered the king of the Medes. And the king of the Medes at that time was his grandfather. And he finally dethroned his grandfather and he became king of the Medes. Not too long after that, he ventured a little bit further and he conquered the king of Lydia. Lydia at that time was another name given for Turkey or Asia Minor. And then shortly after that, I guess after he built up enough steam and he conquered enough lands and he built a name for himself, he finally went to conquer the superpower of the day. And the superpower of the day was Babylon. We speak of Babylon today, the, 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 some of the, um, the ancient wonders of the world, uh, the hanging gardens of, of Babylon. Babylon was an extraordinary land. It was a superpower, almost impenetrable, almost impenetrable until Cyrus came along. Interesting. Interesting. Babylon had gates that were so tall and walls that were so tall. It says of Babylon that even, uh, even the gates of the city extended below the river, the river so that you couldn't even go underneath and conquer them any other way because the, the gates of the city went deep into the waters, into the riverbed, that, that, that it was impenetrable. But of course, Cyrus found a way to conquer that land. Some of the things that King Cyrus is known for He's known for his kindness. He's known for his wisdom. He is known to be a merciful king of kings. I guess that's what made him so great. I would imagine that God created him that way. It says when he, when he conquered his cousin in, in, in Persia, he didn't put him to death. You know, back in those days, you conquer a king and you kill him. He didn't. When he conquered the Medes and, and he conquered his grand, grand, grandfather, the one who wanted to kill him, it says he didn't kill him. Rather, he married, I think he married his daughter or his granddaughter just to, to um, solidify the relationship. But he didn't kill his, his grandfather. Later on, when, when he conquered Lydia, Lydia, king, king of Lydia, he's known as being the richest king of all. He had all of the gold. And when he conquered him, Lydia, the king of Lydia did some not nice things to um, Cyrus, but it says that Cyrus made the king of Lydia one of his chief advisors. Cyrus was a wise man. He was a merciful man, a kind man. Hmm. He had the power to kill, but he did not kill. Cyrus cared for the people. He truly cared for the people. He was called merciful. He was considered to be, or he considered himself to be, a father to the people he ruled. He, he was loved and admired so much that when people discovered that King Cyrus was coming to conquer the land, the people just about rejoiced. Because <laughs> they wanted Cyrus to conquer them because their current monarch or leader was evil such as Babylon and Lydia and the Medes. So when Silas pulled up with his army, the people, <laughs> they wanted to forsake their own kings, and, but they cheered, they were happy for Cyrus because Cyrus had built a name for himself. They knew that Cyrus was a merciful man. They knew he was a good man. They knew that although he conquered all of the great kingdoms of the world, he cared for the people. He took care of them. Hmm, interesting, huh? And he was loved by so many. And this is Cyrus the Great. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why he was called Cyrus the Great. I don't know if, every, if any of you are familiar with the Cyrus Cylinder. It's one of the artifacts that, that were captured in, and unearthed. And it talked about Cyrus the Great and all of his conquests. But some of the things that were written about King Cyrus was that he was a noble man. That he was pure. He was full of integrity. He was generous and simple, but yet he was also known as the king of kings. He was known as the king 
of the four corners of the earth. King Cyrus. King Cyrus. So when we read about him, let's read about him now in, in Isaiah chapter 45. When we read about him in Isaiah chapter 45, it seems as if God is talking in the first person directly to Cyrus. So let's read like a first few verses here. Isaiah chapter 45, in case you're wondering, I'm, I'm reading the English standard version, just for the sake of being different. <laughs> Verse 1 says, thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, the Cyrus anointing, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him and, and the gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. It seems like God went before Cyrus to cause him to conquer the lands. You know, Cyrus had the, uh, uh, the wisdom, the imagination to drain the Euphrates River. That's how he conquered Babylon. He drained the Euphrates River so his army could go underneath the gate that was down to the bed and went inside and conquered this impenetrable land. The high walls meant nothing. He went under the gates of the river. Amazing. How did he get such wisdom? How did he? God... God chose him. The Cyrus anointing, God chose him. All right. So it says that I will go before you and I will make level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. That's speaking of the gates of Babylon. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the, the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, Jehovah, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and for Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though, as we have read, you do not know me. You see, Cyrus did not know Jehovah. He served many other gods. He served the gods of Persia and the gods of Babylon. But he didn't know Jehovah. He didn't serve Jehovah. Verse 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other God beside me. He said this to, to Cyrus because Cyrus conquered many lands. And when he went in to conquer the land, he usually praised the God of the land. Like, for instance, when he conquered Babylon, the, the God of Babylon was Marduk. And when he went into Babylon, he said, thank you, Marduk, for giving me your land, Babylon. And he would give thanks to the gods of the land. And that's how he was also endeared to the people. He didn't shut the people off from their gods. He allowed them to have their gods. But that's when Jehovah steps in and says, make no mistake, there is no God beside me. And it was not Marduk and it was not this guy or the other guy. He says, it was Jehovah that gave you this land and gave you this conquest. And he wanted him to know that for sure, so he put his name in print 100 years before he was born. I want you to know that it was Jehovah, the God that has no competition, huh, that gave you these lands. So, and it was for the sake of Israel, verse 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other beside me. There is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. That people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light uh -huh, and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these thi things. So there were many gods in the land at that time, powerful gods, or so they thought. But the only true God was Jehovah, the Lord our God, the only true God. He had no competition. No one could be, could be compared to him. And Jehovah wanted Cyrus to know that. What I find interesting is he then gives a description of who he is. Verse 7 is something we can ponder forever and ever. He says, I form light and create darkness. He says, all the crazy things that's going on in the world, he says, I, I'm in charge of it all. When you look out in your world today and you see both light and darkness, when you see both good and evil, know that it is the God of heaven that is in charge of it all. Man is not in charge. 
And the devil is not in charge. God says, I'm the one who causes one to rise or one to fall. He says, if you have good times, you can thank me. He says, if you have bad times, you can thank me. <laughs> he says, if you're rich, you can thank me. If you're poor, you can thank me. Because <laughs> I am God. So, <laughs> that's why sometimes I love him and sometimes I'm not really happy with him because I know that God creates both light and darkness. If, uh, if I'm in a good place, it's because of him. And if I'm in a bad place, it's because of him. So he is my, both the love of my life and the source of all of my, my anger <laughs> and frustration, I must honestly say. My only complaint is only to God. As all of the prophets of Israel, their complaint was only to God because they know there was no one else more powerful than God upon the earth. I could go to God and I could say, God, I know this and that and the other thing, but, but you are true. And, and although we might not understand what's going on in life, you might not know what's going on in your life. You might be happy, you might be sad, you might be going through a hard time, you might be going through a good time. But it's God who causes them all and he has purpose in them all. Can we get an amen, amen. on a Sunday morning in the church house? Because sometimes on a Monday it's not so easy. It's just not so easy. Thank God for Sunday. So Jehovah explained and, and told Cyrus who he was. He says, I chose you. I called you. He says, I, I called you to, um, to build my house. I called you to, to set the people free. I called, caused you to, to let my people go back and have their God and have their temple once again. And that was Cyrus, the merciful, Cyrus, the kind one, Cyrus, the one who cared about the people. King Cyrus, he may have been a pagan king. Yes, OK. But he was a good man. And for some of us, that's hard to say, even in the day and age that we live. We say, if you, if you belong to God, you're good. If you don't belong to God, you're not good. But that's not what God says. God said to, to Cyrus, you don't even know me. He says, you serve all the other gods of the land. You don't even know who I am. But yet the, yet, yet the, yet the, um, the artifacts, the, 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 the scribes would write of, of Cyrus and say that he was noble and fair and merciful and kind. And God himself, Jehovah said, he is my anointed and, and he will fulfill everything that I put within in, in his hand. God of heaven anointed Cyrus for a certain task and nothing could stand in his way. He was Cyrus the Great. He, he, he was the king of the greatest territory known to the ancient world, Cyrus the Great. And his ultimate purpose was to build the temple of God, to set God's people free, everybody. So just know that. Amen. So a little bit later on, I want to, let's see. Well, let's look at verse one, 1 through 3 one more time, okay? So it says here, It says the first three verses, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that the gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. Amen. What was the anointed for? God said, I anointed Cyrus. He's my anointed one. What is the anointing for? What is the anointing for? As you and I might want to read this passage, as we want to read it perhaps in regard to ourselves or in certain, certain church circles, I would want to say that, that, that God is going to give me the treasures of darkness. I don't know how you might describe the treasures of darkness, but some of us might just like to describe it as physical prosperity. Like God is going to destroy all of my enemies and no one can stand in front of me. I am, I am anointed for the very purpose that nothing can stand in my way. I am unstoppable. And in the case of Cyrus the Great, all the kings of the land could not stand before him. They all fell. They all fell. And he was absolutely anointed to conquer but what was he anointed to conquer? Truly, I believe that God is speaking to us in this text. And I believe primarily and foremost that Cyrus is anointed foremost. And you and I, like why does God put the anointing of heaven upon you? So you can live a prosperous, successful life. So you can be a conqueror of every, like who do you want to conquer? Oh, I want to conquer my co-workers. I want to conquer my competitors. I want to conquer whoever comes against me. I want to conquer all the liars and cheats of the world. 
I want to conquer everyone who's done me wrong. But that's not really what the anointing is for. I must say, even when I read this passage and I read about the Cyrus anointing and we all want the anointing of God, it's going to cause us to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. I finally got my success. I finally got the good times in life. But I believe, I believe the greatest thing that the Cyrus anointing, the, what is the Cyrus anointing? I believe the greatest thing that we are going to conquer, you ready everybody? Is ourselves. The greatest thing that God is going to cause us to conquer in the year 2024 is ourselves. And he's going to cause us to, to enter into places we have not entered into before. He's going to cause gates to, 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 to fall before us and walls to fall before us. Because there's areas in your life that conquer you. Amen. Amen. There's areas in my life that I'm not happy with. The greatest enemies that I face in this life are not the people in this room, believe it or not. <laughs> They're the people in this room right here. The greatest thing that the Cyrus anointing will cause you to conquer is not all of the known world, if you will, so you can be rich and famous. The greatest thing that the Cyrus anointing will cause you to conquer is yourself is your fears, is your doubts, is your worry, is whatever it is that plagues you. Whatever it is that causes you to be unhappy and miserable, whatever causes you to be confused, whatever it is that troubles your soul. Amen. That's what we all need. And therefore we pray the Cyrus anointing be upon you. So you can conquer who and what? So you can conquer yourself. So you can possess ye your own souls, right? You know the parables, you know the sayings of old, you know the wise sayings. The greatest strength a, a warrior could have is the ability to conquer themselves, is to control themselves, is to subdue their own spirit, if you will. Amen. Amen. Like you are of no power and of no value. You could conquer all the kingdoms of this world, but if you cannot control yourself, you have little strength. Amen. I know this to be true, so do you. And therefore, the Cyrus is an anointing. I pray for it for me. I pray for it for you. I pray that I would enter into lands that has said before, you shall not enter this land. And you shall not possess this land. And it's talking about aspects of my soul and aspects of my life that I don't have control of. Rather have control of me, I must say. Amen. Things that beat me up and beat me down. Yes, yes that's right. Yes. And therefore, the Cyrus anointing, it's... It's, it, 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 you're anointed for what purpose in the year 24? I'll tell you what you're anointed for. To subdue yourselves. To conquer your own souls. Where you finally find peace and rest within your own life. And I find a lot of that has to do with accepting yourself. Right where you are. And I know the world and I know for sure the church won't accept you where you are. But God does. Amen. And you must. You must conquer yourself. How do you conquer yourself? I'll tell you primarily. I'll tell you primarily. You must love yourself and you must accept yourself. Amen. And the greatest love you'll ever know in this world is not the love of a man or the love of a woman. It is you allowing by the grace of God, allowing the grace of God to help you love yourself. I don't know how many of you go through life saying, I love this, I love that, but I don't know how many of you have the terrible words come out of your mouth and say, I hate myself. And for those of you who, who, who dare those words to come out of your mouth or enter your mind, I pray that those days come to an end. And I pray that God would anoint you with the Cyrus anointing. And I pray that you would conquer your own soul. And I pray that you would never say those words again. And I pray that you would find a place of peace and serenity where you will love yourself and accept yourself just as you are. And I think that's the story of Cyrus. Because Cyrus was not a godly man. He had many faults. He served many gods. He did many terrible things. But God somehow approved him and called him and named him and chose him and anointed him and all of the above. And I think it's a lesson for you. I think it's a lesson for me. I think, I think the Cyrus anointing is not for me to go conquer the outside world. I think the Cyrus anointing is for me to c conquer myself, to conquer my soul, the demons in my own life and the demons in your own life. Amen, everybody. 
Amen, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. The Cyrus anointing everybody. And, you know, it's, I believe that, 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 that Cyrus came to that place. I believe that even as a man, the great Cyrus, I believe he came to that place. I mean, his great-grandfather, his grandfather wanted to kill him. He lived in obscurity. He experienced some real terrible things in life. And, um, but I believe he also came to a, a, a place in life where he conquered himself. I don't think you could be known as merciful and kind and caring unless you first somehow conquer yourself. Because when you are unhappy with yourself, you will treat the world really bad. When you don't love yourself, you don't love really much of anyone. When you don't care about you, you don't care about a lot of things. I believe that Cyrus did, by the grace of God, in his calling and his choosing and his anointing, that he conquered himself. That he went down to the depths and he broke down the ancient walls and he broke down the, the strong gates. And, and I think he found the riches of darkness, the treasures hidden in darkness. It's not dollars and cents. The treasures is finding your soul. It's finding your peace. It's finding your purpose. It's finding your being, right? It's finding your greatness because there's greatness inside of you. I believe Cyrus found the greatness not outside the, 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 the walls, not in the conquering of the armies. I, found, I think he found his greatness within himself. Amen. And he found that part of that greatness was to help people and to love people. He conquered kings and, and he made them advisors. He conquered lands and, and he set them free. <sighs> and he said, I'm like a father watching over my children. Can you imagine that? And he wasn't from Jehovah. It said he didn't even know who Jehovah was. But somehow God chose him. And I want us to see that in God choosing him. I want you to see this in God choosing him. I want you to see that God chooses you. Amen. That God chooses you. Not because you know him and not because, according to external terms, not because you're great. And it's not because you don't have faults. Amen. You know, Cyrus is known for some of his wise sayings. I believe one of his wise sayings, let me see, I have a few of them written down here. He says, he says one of his wise sayings, he says, In your search for friends, you must look past their faults or you will never find a friend. <laughs> Amen. And Cyrus was able to say this because he knew he had faults. But somehow he was, by the grace of God, able to look past his own faults. I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question, but, but, but one of absolute, um, I don't know, worthiness to be pondered. But do you forgive yourselves? Do you forgive yourselves of your faults? Do you even accept some of your faults? Do you accept who you are? Because even as the great King Cyrus says, he says, unless you accept the faults of others, you will never have a friend in this world. <sighs> Man, isn't that refreshing? Because isn't that true? We need each other desperately, but if I find your faults and then I'm not your friend, I'm a very lonely, angry, miserable person. But when I have permission from heaven that says I can overlook you, I need permission from heaven, don't you? I need heaven to say, Mike, overlook their faults and love them anyway. And then he uses me as an example and he uses you as an example. He says, you're full of faults and I love you anyway and I want to teach you how to love yourself. Yes. How about that? How about that? Is God working on anybody with that one? Is he teaching you to love yourself? Every day. Yeah, every day. Yeah, I find he's teaching me that. He's teaching because there's some things in my life I can't get out of my life. How about you? But God is teaching us in that to love yourself and to accept yourself, to know your worth and your value even in the midst of it all, because there's not a human being on this earth without fault. And I think that's the Cyrus calling. I think that's your calling. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's big. I think it's significant. I really do. So in this in this in this cyrus anointing where we get high-minded in our religion that we think we're supposed to be better than everybody else and smarter and stronger and we can bind the devil on a thousand different people i say let me just bind the demons in my own life <laughs> let me just conquer my own demons lord knows i mean you can't conquer your own why are you worried about everybody else's demons <laughs> 
And then, and then why don't you wink a little bit? You, anybody, you guys know how to wink? You ever, you ever learned to wink as a child? You got to wink a little bit. <laughs> when you're looking for friends, when you're looking for new friends, you got to learn to wink. Can you do that? Because if you can't wink, you ain't going to have no friends. <laughs> you got to wink a little bit. And I'm going to give you one tip. You ready, guys? You ready? Everybody ready? In the morning, tomorrow morning, when you wake up, when you look in the mirror, this is what I want you to do. I want you to wink at yourself. <laughs> you and I know. <laughs> I want you to give yourself a little wink. You know, sometimes I think I get over on God. You ever think you get over on God? I mean, I know I get over on you guys. You're easy. <laughs> I'm still standing here, right? Yeah, I got over on you guys. But sometimes <laughs> I think I get over on God. And then he tells me, Mike, you fool. Who do you think is covering you? Who do you think made sure that none of them saw you? Yeah. God made sure that you don't see me. Just, you know why? Because you're learning how to wink. You haven't mastered it yet. <laughs> you're still learning how to wink. <laughs> yeah. The Cyrus anointing. The Cyrus anointing, everybody. All right. So let me, let me show you something here. So, so God is, is speaking directly to Cyrus. Later on, when there was a prophet that showed Cyrus this, he was blown away. He could not believe that his own name was written in a book of 100 years before he was born. And, and as he read this, he says, that's exactly what I did to Babylon. And it was written way before I did it. What a shocker, man. But then when God gets finished talking directly to, to Cyrus, the heathen, he's got to talk to his own people. You and me, if you will. He's got to talk to his own people. You got your Bibles there? Turn to verse 9 and 10 now. Amen. And now after God is speaking directly to Cyrus and he's calling him his anointed and so on, he, it's, it's interesting. He has a few choice words for his own people, the, the ones who say they do know him. Isn't that something? The ones that say they do know him. So in 9 and 10, God, God speaks to his own people and he says this. He says, whoa. How come, how come his own people get a Whoa. He says, woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen pots. Does the clay, you guys know passages like this, does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your, or, or your work has no handles. Amen. Verse 10. Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor? It's like the people of Israel question God. You know what they were questioning God about this time? How dare you choose Cyrus? You're going to choose Cyrus to save us? He doesn't even know who you are. He's a pagan. Why are you choosing Cyrus? And that's when God steps in and says, who are you to tell me what to do? Amen. And I know God says to me, and I think he says to you, all too often, everybody, we speak words without wisdom. We think we know God and what's going on in this world. We know nothing. We need to be led by humility and mercy and kindness. Because that's the only safe place. It's interesting that, that the people who say they know God are the ones with the false judgments. It seems like the ones that say they know God are the ones that don't know mercy. And don't know that God can reach beyond what we call limits. He says, I didn't choose you. He said, I chose this pagan man. He says, you sure? Maybe you can relate it to now terms and you can say, who are you to tell God? That he was wrong putting the leaders in leadership. I know we all got different ideas about who should be a leader and who shouldn't be a leader. But God would say to you, oh, you clay, who are you to say who I put in charge? Because God says, I'm the only one that puts people in charge. Uh -huh. The only rules you have in this land is the ones that God says you rule for whatever purpose it may be, everybody. And I know you and I don't understand it. That's why we speak a plethora of words without wisdom. We are ignorant fools in our conversations, and we have no idea what we're talking about. 
We don't, we don't know mercy. We don't know love. We don't know God. We don't know forgiveness. They are way beyond us. And I pray that we come to a place of understanding that we're not only it's, it's hard for us, guys, because, you know, we because we're raised in a church, unfortunately, that teaches us not to accept ourselves at times. The church is, is, is too often. It speaks of a judgment day in our future. But it very rarely speaks of the, the greatest judgment day that was in our past. And the greatest judgment day is not in your future. I don't care what the church preaches. The greatest judgment day is not in the future. It is not tomorrow. It was yesterday and you missed it. It was called the cross. Uh -huh. The greatest day this earth has ever seen was the cross of Calvary. Judgment day. He was the lamb that took away the sins of the world. And you and I can't see it. We can't accept it. We don't understand it. Amen. That's why we don't accept ourselves. We constantly beat ourselves up over our, our shortcomings and our sins, if you will, over we're good and we're bad. We're, we're good people. We're bad people. And we can't accept and love ourselves because we don't understand the forgiveness of the cross. Uh -huh. We don't understand the mercy of God. Yes. We don't understand it for ourselves. How can we give it to the world? We don't. We throw the world in hell. We can't even accept it for ourselves. Like we're barely making it in as far as we're concerned in regard to our religion. I don't know. And God says, he says to his own people, he says to his own people, he didn't say to Cyrus, he said to his own people, he says, you don't know me. And who are you to question me? God said, he says, I create light and darkness. I create good and evil. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> How about that, everybody? Yeah. Yeah. And I think Cyrus, the Cyrus anointing, it's here to, to give us a gift. I believe it's here to give us a gift. Amen, everybody. Do you remember even when, you remember Habakkuk's complaint? Habakkuk was another known, you, you know, you ever, anyone here of Habakkuk? He was another known prophet. He had two complaints against God. You know what his complaints against God was? God said, he said, to, Habakkuk said to, to God, I know Israel has sinned. And I know we've done wrong and I know we've deserved judgment. But how can you send a more wicked nation than ourselves to be the punisher? And that was the Bab Babylonians. God was sending the Babylonians to punish Israel. And Habakkuk couldn't understand that. He says, how can you send somebody more wicked than us to punish us? And then years after their imprisonment, they say the same thing. How could you send Cyrus? You think they would have learned their lesson? You think we would have come to understanding? I guess it just takes time. I don't know, right? It takes time for you to change your old ways and your own thinking and your own understanding. It takes time. Yeah, it takes, it takes time. Oh, my goodness. But I, I want us to get to, 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 to really the base of this. He says, he says, do not argue with God. Do not argue with God about who is in leadership, if you will, or whom I, I choose for leadership. Now, if God can use Cyrus, everybody, and this is where, where, we, where we're blessed, I, I guess. If God can use Cyrus, if God could use the Babylonians, if God could use Cyrus with all of his faults, listen, God can use you. Amen. And God can use me. Yes. And that's why I do what I do. And that's why you can do what you're called to do. Amen. It's not because of the lack of faults. No, it isn't. It's because of God Almighty. The Cyrus anointing. He will anoint you. He will empower you. He will enable you. Not because you are fault free. No. Because none of us are. But because of his greatness. And that's why even in his teachings, God would want to say to Cyrus, he says, there's nobody like me. You think there's a God like me? And I would say to you and to myself, there's nobody like our God. No human being can compare to our God. As human beings, we are judgmental and unforgiving and unkind and ignorant and unwise and unknowing and so on and so forth. There's nobody compared to him. My God. My God has forgiven me of the worst of things. How about you? My God has loved me in the middle of the, of, of, of the dirtiest places. My God has never stopped loving me, never stopped revealing himself to me, never stopped choosing to use me. It's called the Cyrus anointing, and it's yours. It's yours. In the midst of all of your faults, God says, I choose you. And he anoints you 
powerfully to subdue. To subdue who and what? Your greatest enemy of all. Yourself. And you will not stop yourself from doing the work of God. And you will not stop yourself from believing that you're a good, kind, merciful person. Amen. Amen. Because you will subdue these nations inside of you. Amen, everybody. Amen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And God says, I choose you and you will come to an acceptance of terms that says, yes, that's right. <laughs> God did choose me. Uh-huh. Therefore, let him use us mightily. Amen. So what did he choose us for? Okay, a couple of things now. Isaiah 45, 13, it says this. It says in 13, it says, I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all of his ways level. For he shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. I do believe that God is also calling to build him a city. I believe that that's what we're called to in 2024. I believe that God is anointing you and calling you. He wants you to build him a house. Who? You. All you builders. Wink, wink, wink. <laughs> All you contractors. Yeah. All you administrators. All you wise people that go out into the work field Monday to Friday. God says, I anointed you, and I called you, and I chose you for his glory. It is not for profit. It is not for reward. It is to build the house of our God. And the only one that's going to stop you is you. Therefore, therefore, you need the anointing of God. You need the anointing of God to di discover and unearth the treasures of darkness. To find out who you really are. To find out the resources deep inside of you. Some of you don't see yourself as you are. But I say every now and again, God lets me see you. And I see that you are mighty. And I see that you are powerful. I see that you have gifts that nobody else has. And I know sometimes you might look at yourself or try to see yourself through the eyes of everybody around you. And you might see yourself as diminished or unworthy or, or somehow crippled in some way. But I thank God that every now and again he gives us the eyes to see each other. And I tell you, as a mortal man, I see riches in you. I see glory in you. I see ability and capability. I see that you can do things that nobody else can do. I believe that you have heart and soul and resources and passion. And I believe that you want to build our, our God a city. I tell you what, the lasting legacy that we want upon this earth is to build a city for our God. That is right, everybody. And that is what we are anointed to do. And the only one that can take that from you is you. And therefore, the, Cyrus, the first thing the Cyrus will, anointing will do is to cause you to conquer yourself. Know that and hear that today. Hear that. Go home with that. The first thing that God will cause you to do is to conquer your own soul. And say, God called me. He chose me. I got gifts that nobody else has. Just let me loose. Let me do what I do. Amen. Amen. And I believe that even as we approach our anniversary next year, we're going to put out the, the charge. You guys need to put your names on it. I don't know what, maybe you know what God's called you to do. Maybe you don't know, but you just got to sign up, man. You got to, we got to sign up. I'm going to put some sign up sheets, physically sign up. <laughs> and you got to sign up to the task at hand. My goodness, God says, build me a city. What else are you going to trouble yourself with? Yours? Your city? Yours? Your house? Which one would you rather build? Would you rather build your house or God's house? You know what God says? No, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> God says, you build my house. Give me your passion. Give me your time. Give me your resources. Build my house. He says, why does my house lay in ruins? He says, build. It's in your hands. You can make the house of God great. But sometimes the house of God is in ruins because we're building our houses. But you have resources, you have gifts and talents and, and abilities. You can do things. Why should his house be in ruins? He says, build my house. And in turn, he says, 
what only a tremendous, beautiful, loving God can say. He says, I will build yours. I will build yours. But who will build my house? Amen, everybody. Amen, Amen, everybody. The Cyrus anointing will do two things. First, it'll have to cause you to conquer your own souls. Stop disqualifying yourself. You are more rich, more beautiful, more precious, more able than you ever know. There's greatness inside of you. Cyrus the Great knew that, and that's why he rose. He knew the greatness was inside of him. Amen. And number two, God says, build my house. When Cyrus found out that it was written in ancient scripture that God wanted him to build his house, he was like, God, why would you choose me to build your house? Sometimes I get the bug. You guys ever get the bug? I get the bug. I say, God, I want your house to be the greatest house. I want it to be pretty and beautiful. I want it to be rich and full. Amen. Don't you? I don't want God's house to be empty. I want it to be full and rich. And I want it to be a haven, a lush haven, if you will. There's nothing greater on this earth. And even with that, he still gives the promise. He doesn't have to give the promise, but he gives the promise. And he doesn't let your house go unnoticed. He says, I'll build yours. Don't worry. I'll take care of you. There's already people of faith in the house. If we only had faith in God, we would stop chasing our lives. We would stop worrying and fretting. If we only had faith in God, we wouldn't be afraid of the snow of the winter. We wouldn't be afraid of money and houses. If we only had faith in God, he would take care of us and we would build him a great house. I believe 2024, it's the Cyrus anointing. And my prayer is for you personally. Yes, first of all, everybody, that you accept your own faults, you accept yourself. And know that you in the place where you are right now, you are absolutely extraordinary, irreplaceable, called and anointed by God to do something great for him. I want to end. I have a a quote here from, from Cyrus the Great. He had many quotes. He was a wise man. I want to end with this quote from Cyrus the Great. You know what? Did we ever show that picture, Brother Keith? Let, we got, I think we got a picture of Cyrus the Great. Ah, let's show him a picture. I was going to lead with that. Let's end with it. That's Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great. Ah, he was king of Persia. He was king of this and that and the other thing. He was king of Media, king of Babylon, king of Sumer, uh, king of uh, Akkad, king of, well, he was king of the four corners of the world, everybody. He was known as the king of kings. This is one of his sayings. You ready? One of his sayings. He says, success always calls for greater generosity. Though most people lost in the darkness of their own egos treat it as an occasion for greater greed. Collecting wealth is not an end in itself but only a means for building an empire. Riches would be of little use to us now, except as a meaning of winning friends. Know why we have the wealth that we have. It is to build an empire for God. It is to make friends. Do you know that? It is to win souls. He who winneth souls is wise. This is what Cyrus knew. He didn't even know God. We know God. We were raised in the church. We are the people of God. Amen, everybody. May the word of God minister to you all. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I'm going to ask you all to stand unless I praise and worship you to come forward. The Cyrus anointing, everybody. God bless you. Amen. You believe that? Yes and amen? It's really the only two options you got in life (laughs) because it's already completed. Okay, the Cyrus anointing. Well, if he's anointed us, then uh, we got to do something with that anointing. Amen? Amen. I think it's Psalms 37 that says, The steps of a good man is ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his ways. Though he fall, he will not be utterly cast down.
for the Lord will uphold him with his hand. The good man is going to fall according to scripture. It's ordered by the Lord. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what scripture just said. But what's he going to do? He's going to pick us up. Why? Well, I think to go build the city. That's what he said this morning. To go build his city. And church, listen, the answer is never outside of us. Wisdom is before him who has understanding. But the eyes of the fool, they will reach to the ends of the earth. We shouldn't be looking outside of ourselves to find the answer to our trouble, our problems, our solutions, our joy, our happiness, our salvation. It is always within. Wisdom is a person. It's Christ. It's inside of us. Amen. We don't have to look outside of ourselves. We don't have to look all over the place to try and find the answer or the solution. It's inside of you. It is the anointing that he has placed inside of us. Amen. Let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful, Lord, for this day, Lord God. And yes, Lord, we acknowledge the anointing, the anointing that you've placed on this ministry, Lord, on this body of believers, Lord, this church, this family, Lord God. You have chosen us and anointed us, Lord God, to do this work, to build your city, Lord, to restore your city, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that you've actually placed this mantle on us. That you trust us with that, Lord God. We are grateful, Lord God. And we know, Lord God, by your hand and your providence, Lord God, that you've given us everything that we need to do this, Lord. So we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for the word, Lord. We thank you for your love, Lord, for your goodness and for all that you are doing. We pray your blessings on each and every one here today, Lord God. And pray, Lord, that we'll continue in your love and in your grace and in your mercy. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.